game theory is really cool. And I think that one of the things I sort of relatively recently found out is that there's a package called Axelrod package, we'll see it now, that makes it super, super easy to just throw the things you want from sort of very basic game theory into Python. Uh, uh, and that makes it really easy to set up tournaments, play against the computer, see which strategies work, which don't, and get all of these things sort of plotted nicely on your computer so that you can see the results and it's all really fun. Uh, so I figured I'd show you uh, how it's done. We will need to, because I'm assuming not all of you know even a little bit of game theory, uh, go through sort of the very, very basics of what game theory is and how it works and then show why it's so much easier to write in Python than to understand what you are writing in Python. So we'll start with, and I'm assuming a lot of you have heard this before, we'll start with the story of a bank robbery. So two people, say you and a partner, go to rob a bank. You all obtain guns illegally. Uh, you put on these uh, fancy, fashionable sock masks that hide your face. You get into your car and you drive to the bank. Uh, and as you park near the bank, uh, a police car shows up. They see people wearing fashionable sock masks and they arrest you and take you to the police station. Not the, the most successful bank robbery, but uh, there you have it. Um, they put you into two separate rooms and tell you, well, you really have two options. We pretty much know you are going to rob a bank. Uh, your partner might confess and rat you out, so you have the option of whether you want to confess yourself or keep silent. And they explain what will happen depending on all of the possible options. So they show you this table. Um, the table says pretty simply, if both you and your partner stay silent, then we can't actually prove you're trying to rob a bank. Uh, we can get you for uh, illegally having uh, guns, and you'll go each for two years in prison. If you both confess, then we'll have you for bank robbery, uh, and you'll get, well, you did confess, so you won't get the full 20 years, you'll get 15 years in prison. But here's the interesting thing. If one of you confesses, and the other one doesn't, the person who confesses cuts a deal with the police to give up their partner. So, in the case that you confess and your partner stays silent, then you cut a deal with the police and you only go to prison for one year. But in the other case, where your partner confesses and you stay silent, the other person cuts a deal with the police and you go for the full 20 years. Hmm. They're, they're smarter than they seem. Uh, we call this the prisoner's dilemma. And what we do is we'll usually look at it in more general terms terms, so we'll say you can either cooperate, in this case cooperate is with your partner, not with the police, so cooperating is staying silent, or you can defect, which is sort of go for your own benefit rather than your partner's. And we'll call the different payoffs that you can get, so if you both cooperate you get the reward payoff, which will give, say, three points, if you both defect you'll get the punishment payoff for defecting, one point, and then there's the temptation payoff, which is why you might want to screw over your partner, and the sucker payoff if you were screwed over. This is considerably more insidious than it looks. Uh, it's a pretty bad situation to be in, in the prisoner's dilemma, because the main question that you want to ask is, so what would you do, right? So what's the best thing to do? And before we actually ask that question, I'll make one comment about it. It could be that your actual motivations are not as they are on this graph. So for instance, if you're part of the mob, and they tell you, look, if you ever confess, we're going to catch you and chop you up then your motivations aren't like they are on that graph. Possibly the row where you defect is minus 100 and minus 100 because you really, really don't want to be chopped up. So under the assumption that these are more or less what our motivations are like, what's the best thing to do in the situation? And the answer is actually pretty simple. The answer is you always, always defect. And the reason is very simple. You have no way to control or to affect what your partner is going to do. You don't know what your partner is going to do. So let's look at your options. Maybe your partner is going to cooperate. If your partner cooperates, the best thing for you to do is defect because you get five points instead of three points or one year instead of two years in prison. If your partner defects, then the best thing for you to do is defect because you get one point instead of zero point or 15 instead of 20 years in prison. And the really, really bad thing about this is that your partner is in the exact same situation you are. So you make this sort of thought about process, no matter what happens, I'd rather defect. And your partner makes the same sort of thought process, no matter what happens, I'd rather defect. And then the likely thing is you both defect, and the likely thing is you go, both get the punishment payoff, which is a pretty bad place to be. It's the third worst outcome for each of you, and it's the absolute worst outcome if you look at both of you together. So this kind of sucks. 
The only thing that we've got to hope is that it doesn't really show up a lot in real life. And, and, and the problem is that we'd be sorely disappointed. Uh, when I do the full 90 minute talk, uh, I go more deeply into 10 examples. Uh, uh, for now, I'll go uh, relatively uh, to a small amount into three examples. Uh, usually people look at arms races as prisoners' dilemmas because two countries that are in a conflict in each other can each decide how much money they want to put into amping up their military and sort of buying more guns and getting more soldiers. And a lot of times you won't know what the other country did until it's possibly too late. And again, if the countries were able to, to coordinate well, then possibly they'd both rather not put a lot of money into the military, put that money into education, into infrastructure, into lots of other things. But those temptations sucker pay off, right? What if I don't put any money into my military, but they do? then I'm in the absolute worst position. And the temptation, what if they don't put any money, but I do, then maybe I can be much, much stronger, sort of gets you to defect and sort of build up arms races, right? We see the same thing with prices between different corporations and in economics. So different stores selling similar products, right? Each of them can defect by lowering the price, right? If they could all coordinate well, they'd all keep prices high, and they all benefit from high profit margins. But the fact that each of them can defect sort of gets, gets uh, uh, profits down and gets prices down. In this case, the prisoner's dilemma is between corporations and it's actually quite beneficial to consumers. That's why we have a lot of laws that don't allow syndicates because we want this prisoner's dilemma because consumers benefit even though companies don't. Last really interesting story is that a while ago there was a law passed in, in the United States that significantly limited how much money tobacco companies can put into advertising. And the really interesting thing about this is was that the ones pushing most strongly for this were lobbies for tobacco companies. And the reason they did that is that they figured out that most of what the ads are doing is getting customers from one company to the other, and they're not very efficient at getting new people to smoke. And so they were in this annoying prisoner's dilemma. None of them were able to take down their ads significantly because they'd lose customers to all of the other, the other companies. But if you could get somehow everyone to lower the amount of money they put on ads together, then all of the tobacco companies would benefit. How nice it is that we've got lobbies in Congress and we can get this law passed, or, well, nice is one way of putting it. So what do we do with this prisoner's dilemma, which causes people to defect and not cooperate, and which is very hard to sort of subvert? One main way that we do this is do the iterated prisoner's dilemma, because the main thing that we said, which was part of the reason that you always want to defect, is that you have no way to affect what the other side is going to do. And if you do an iterated prisoner's dilemma, which means you do it over and over and over again for a lot, a lot of times, then that changes. Maybe if I defect, I cause the other side to defect more. Maybe if I cooperate, I can get the other side to try cooperating and see that it works. And we actually see this because there were tons and tons of psychological and social experiments, getting p different people to play prisoner's dilemma against each other. And we saw lots of really interesting things. And we saw people actually cooperating. Uh, a mathematician named Axelrod started a tournament. Different people could put in computer programs that would play Prisoner's Dilemma. They played against each other. Uh, and it became quite famous because the winner of that competition was a strategy that was incredibly simple, um, which was called tit for tat. And tit for tat was a fun strategy. What it did was it always starts out by cooperating. So it starts by being nice. Let's see, let's see if we can work together and everything will be good. And from the second round and onwards, it will always mirror exactly what you did in the last round. So if somebody cooperates back to me, we'll always cooperate and everything will be great. If somebody defects, I'll defect next turn. But I'm very easily forgiving. If you'll cooperate next turn, I'm willing to cooperate again. I'll always do exactly what you did last time. Tit for Tat won the first tournament. They had another tournament later where everybody knew that Tit for Tat won that first tournament. There were lots of strategies specifically aimed to beat Tit for Tat, and Tit for Tat still won the second tournament as well. It proved to be quite, quite strong in quite a lot of scenarios. And the interesting thing is that when we look at things like the iterated prisoner's dilemma, we still see it again and again and again. And one of the most interesting cases is the three-spined stickleback fish, uh, which is a really interesting fish. They go in schools and they have a few predators. And there's value for the schools of fish to get nearer to the, to the predator, to see if the predator is looking for food if they're hungry, if it actually is a predator or some other fish that looks like it. But any single fish that goes forward takes an increased amount of risk, right? So you'd expect that if there are some fish who go forward and some fish who don't, 
then the fish who go forward will tend to die more, and evolution works that way, so you'd expect none of the fish to go forward, but you do see schools of fish moving nearer to predators to look at them. And so they did an experiment. They put stickle, a single stickleback fish in a pool. At the end of the pool, there was a predator with some glass to stop them from actually eating them, and there was a mirror. And different times, they changed the, way, the angle of the mirror so that in one case, as soon as the stickleback fish moves forward, it sees this partner move forward with them. And when it sees that this moving forward is being reciprocated, it moves forward and forward and gets actually much, much closer than they, closer than they do in nature. Change the mirror angle. Now the stickleback fish moves forward, sees the other fish swimming slightly away. Moves a small amount forward, the other fish moves a little bit slightly away, and then it doesn't move forward at all. So even in nature, you see this sort of strategy of sort of tit for tat, let's see if it's reciprocated, let's see what the other one does, and I'll do the same. So we want to know which strategies work in different contexts, and I think it's about time that we start seeing a little bit of code. We'll get to the more interesting parts later, but the axelrod package, named after that same axelrod, it's incredibly easy to create players with different strategies. So in this case, player one is a cooperator. It's a strategy that means you always cooperate. Player two will be a defector, always defect, and player three, tit for tat. If we want to run a mash to see who wins between each two of them, it's incredibly simple. We create a match from the two players, how many rounds we want, in this case, five. Match.play gives us the exact results, so who cooperates and who defects. If we do it cooperator versus defector, it's a very sad thing to see. And then the final scores by getting the final scores. 0 and 25, defector exploits the cooperator quite handily. If you play cooperator versus tit for tat, they'll both cooperate all the way till the end. I'll get 15 points, everyone is pretty happy. If we play tit for tat against the defector, we'll see that the tit for tat wants to cooperate in the beginning, right? We get that DC, tries to cooperate, sees that it doesn't work, and then they'll both keep defecting forever. Um, defector wins, but not by as high a margin as it won before. And obviously, even if we had 500 matches, it would still only win by those same five points, because they all both keep defecting together. We can obviously run more than one game. We just saw the match. We can also run a tournament. Tournament means you put in as many players as you want. Every player plays against every single other player, and then you tally up the score. And we can do what we will see in a second, because that's probably the coolest way to see which strategies beat which other strategies is the Moran process. The Moran process is really interesting. We take as many players as we want, we play them all against one another. At the end of every round, we choose some of the more successful ones to duplicate them. So there's a random function, you can Google and find it out. Uh, uh, it means that you have a better chance of being duplicated if you did better in the last round. Um, and then, because we don't want to increase the number of players, we'll delete some of the players randomly. There are less random ways where you always duplicate the most successful and always delete the least successful. I think this one is the most common that I've seen used in actual research. So let's tell another story and then see how we can try things out in Python. So we start working at Random Corp, which is a very strange company. Um, every single month, every two employees work together on a project. That might sound a little bit like a game theory tournament to you. Uh, that might, might or might not be a coincidence. Um, at the end of every project, every one of the employees can, behind their partner's back, go to the boss and say, you know what, I actually did all the work. I should get all the credit for this. Let's, let's call this defecting, for instance. And let's say not doing this, let's call it cooperating. Um, if both of you cooperate and don't go to claim a credit, you both get equal and, and reasonably, high, reasonably high credit. If you both defect, then you were quite annoying, and therefore you're probably going to get less credit. But if one of you goes to claim all the credit and, credit and the other one doesn't, then that person gets a lot of credit, uh, maybe less than what both of you would have gotten together, but definitely a lot, and the sucker gets very little. Let's say, give this matrix. It might, it might seem familiar. I'm not, I'm not sure from where you would know this. Um, and then at the end of year, after 12 months, we do end of year reviews. Um, what we do in the end of year reviews, we randomly, but with some correlation to how much uh, uh, credit you got, uh, uh, decide to give people promotions. Uh, whenever you're promoted, you get to bring on a friend, which will always do the same strategy as you. Uh, uh, if you want the exact formula, Google Moran process. Uh, and then we realize that we don't have budget to have everyone and fire random people out of the corporation. Sounds more or less right, I think. 
So what strategy would you use to succeed at Random Corp? Uh, and that is actually a trick question. And the reason it's a trick question is because that depends very heavily on what strategies people are already using in this, in this company. Uh, and we'll see two examples, a simple one and then a really interesting one. Uh, but just to sort of give you this idea, let's say you come into Random Corp and every single one is a defector. Right? So there's nobody who will ever not go behind your back to the boss and claim credit. Right? If this is the company that you came into, there's no point in ever cooperating. Right? They'll never change, they'll never start cooperating back, they'll always defect. Every time you don't go and claim credit, you lose, you get the sucker, and nothing good happens. Right? So it obviously depends on what other strategies people are using. So let's see two examples. Right? So simple example. Defectors and cooperators. We'll start with creating uh, all our players, five def cooperators, five defectors. Um, we'll create a RAND process. Players, the amount of turns per round is 12 because we have 12 months in a year. Uh -oh. And then we play. Populations will now hold a list where every item in the list gives us the exact amount that you have at each round. So populations zero will have five and five because we start at 50-50. So what's going to happen? Will the cooperator's ability to cooperate and, and sort of get more overall credit win out, or will the defectors be able to claim enough credit to, to push cooperators out? And the answer is that pretty much always the same thing happens, and it's pretty sad, um, and, and the defectors uh, will win. Um, the winning, you can see winning strategy name is defector, and then if you look at how many defectors there are over time, so you see they, they go up pretty quickly, uh, uh, those many, many rounds with nine is just how much time it takes until we randomly fire that last sucker left, who's getting really, really low scores every time, but just happened to be, in this uh, simulation at least, relatively lucky to not get fired randomly for quite a few rounds. Um, the same thing will happen if you start out with a lot of cooperators and very few defectors. They'll just slowly take over the cooperators. Um, there's a small chance that you accidentally fire the very few defectors right on the start if there are really, really small number of them, but that's very rare. Usually, if you have only defectors and cooperators, defectors will win out, um, which kind of sucks. Um, don't, don't be a simple cooperator. Um, so let's do something more interesting. Let's say that we have this company where most people, say 9 out of 15, are cooperators, right? So they're, they're decent human beings, to be honest, and aren't going to go behind people's backs and, and claim credit, right? Which sounds like what most, most decent human beings would do. Uh, three are defectors, they will always go and claim credit, and three are sort of the more sophisticated tit-for-tat players. Uh, they will, every year, start out by cooperating with every single person, but then again, they will sort of copy what you did in the last month uh, uh, continuously. And so again, we create the Moran process, and again, we play. Um, so what's going to happen? And, and the first thing that I want to say before I show you the results in my simulation um, is that this does change quite heavily depending on sort of randomness in it. Um, each of the three can win theoretically, because mostly because my numbers are, are small. So if we had um, much higher numbers, it would be much easier to sort of go into a specific solution, which is, which is the solution that I'll show, uh, depending on the numbers again. But with smaller numbers, Randomness does take quite a big part. Uh, but what happened in this simulation is actually really, really interesting. As you can see, I, I, I took it in uh, uh, jumps of three just to be able to fit it on the screen. It's still very hard to see. Um, the first row shows you the defectors, second row shows you cooperators, and third row shows you tit for tats. Um, and the interesting thing is if you look at the first eight or ten columns, then you see that Cooperators are shooting down. They're being taken advantage of by the defectors, and the defectors are shooting up. They're getting huge scores. They're doing really well. There are so many cooperators they can take advantage of. They're getting really good interview reviews. Uh, and by eight or 10 uh, rounds in, you see you have 10 or 11 defectors. That's huge. That's more than we had cooperators in the beginning. But as soon as that happens, the makeup of the company changes. Now most people are defectors. There are very few cooperators left. Defectors don't really effectively take advantage of each other and don't effectively take advantage of the tit for tats. They only take advantage of the cooperators, which are very few. And suddenly, tit for tats start doing better because they don't lose too much to the defectors, but they do very, very well with each other, full-on cooperation, and they do very, very well with a few cooperators left, full-on cooperation. And so you see that right after that, the tit for tats shoot two, three, four, seven, nine, ten, 
11. They shoot up really, really strongly as long as there are mostly defectors, but enough tit for tats and cooperators to get advantage from. As soon as most of the company is tit for tats, defectors have a really, really bad environment and they shoot down really quickly. So they actually die out in the company before the cooperators do. So defectors are actually kicked out much more faster than cooperators do because they can't play well with the tit for tats. And eventually, between cooperators and tit for tats, which we see in the probably last third of the screen there, everybody's cooperating, we've got a nice company, everybody's happy, nobody's claiming credit, and it's only random firings that decide that uh, eventually tit for tats will beat out the cooperators. So this is really cool. Uh, and we can change the numbers and we can input lots of other strategies. So we've got grudgers, uh, uh, which will cooperate until the first time they've been defected against and then they will defect forever. We've got really smart strategies that try to cooperate, cooperate, defect, cooperate, get a read on the other strategy and then make a decision depending on how the other strategy works against them. Uh, uh, we've got uh, cheating strategies that look at the source code and the state of the other strategy in order to see what it does. Uh, and some of them that actually change the state of the other uh, uh, of the other strategy in order to sort of try to win them and get them to do stupid things. Um, lots of really cool things and we can try all of these out. Um, other things that we can do. So as I said, there are over 200 base strategies in there. Lots of really, really cool things that you haven't thought of. Uh, we've got strategy transformers. So you can do things like flip it in certain cases, decide between two strategies depending on something. Lots of things that you can make your own strategies and obviously human players as well. So you can play against these things and see how well you would do uh, against different strategies. Uh, we can do more games. So we've only looked at specifically the prisoner's dilemma. There are lots of similar and also very interesting games uh, uh, that are done. And it's really easy. Just give it the values for the payoff matrix and you can have a different game. So probably, probably the second most well-known game is chicken. Uh, creating it is as easy as axel.game and then give it the numbers, and then we can play that game and play tournaments and see who wins. Um, and lots of other cool stuff. So adding noise, right? So in real life, sometimes I want to cooperate, but something happens, right? And causes me to defect. Problems in communication. Somebody else told the boss that I did all the work, right? Lots of other things, and so we can add noise in there. Um, and that changes drastically the results. So for instance, if we said that tit for tat is a strategy that plays really, really well against itself, right? It'll always cooperate. Even a small amount of noise one tit for tat's cooperation becomes a defection, and then suddenly we have this person defects, next round this person defects, next round this person defects, and they go back and forth and keep screwing each other over and getting a lot less, a lot less points. So noise can change results quite drastically. Um, game length, obviously, but also things like some strategies actually look at the game length. How many rounds do we have left? Maybe if it's the last round I want to defect because there's no reason to care about future cooperation. And so I can also tell strategies that the game length is different than it actually is and see if I can get them to do weird things that they wouldn't have done before. Um, and lots of more stuff. So there's a ton of things to do. Uh, it's got relatively clear documentation. I, I, do, I do think that just going and looking at what this, this can do is actually really interesting. And that is it. Any questions? Uh, so, so, so yeah, it's a good question. Uh, have I or, or really anyone ever used this for anything useful? Uh, um, th there's, there's, there's really sort of two ways to answer. So the sort of very, very basic game theory that we see here, so create a game, try out strategies, see what, what, what works and what doesn't, I think it's mostly useful for sort of very abstract research about how things work in general. So why do we get cooperation between fish or between birds where we wouldn't see, okay, let's try to sort of see their game, see different strategies, see what works. So it's all very abstract because the the real life is usually more complex than you'll get in, in a game like this. Uh, there are areas in game theory that are specifically applicable more either around auction theory, which is much, much more applicable, or if you start getting a little further ahead and start talking about uh, um, Nash equilibria or probabilistic strategies, in which case you can actually start th seeing things that are useful in the real world. But I think that to the extent that we've seen it here, it's mostly either for fun, because it really is pretty fun, or to sort of understand very abstract ideas, but less applicable, uh, uh, straightforward as it is like this. Yes? Yeah, so, so the question is about the, the tit for task strategy. When we play against lots of different players, who do I defect against Have I when, when I've been defected against before? Um, each match against a specific player is completely different from the other ones. So if 
this player defected against me, I will defect against that same player next round or next month. Uh, uh, I, I, I will do it completely differently between the different players. And the way that it's actually implemented is that like, we think about it because of the story of the company, like sort of months happen in parallel, but that's not how it actually happens. It runs a tournament, every two players play 12 prisoners' dilemmas against each other, tit for tat, tit for tat, tit for tat, done, now I go to the next player. Cooperate first one because it's a new player, and, and play that strategy again. So there's no connection between the games between different players. Yes? Have you tried to like, continue your research, like, like deep learning, and make it like, much more more sophisticated so you can learn from some conclusions and stuff like this? I've, I've, not, I've not seen deep learning done to sort of create strategies for simple game theory games. Um, I'm not sure if it would be a bit of an overkill, but I, I'd be interested in seeing, in seeing it done. Like, it's, it sounds, it sounds at, least, at least somewhat intriguing. Uh, but, but I don't know of a case where that happened. Pro somebody probably did it. I, I, I would guess that somebody probably did it sometime. So the question was about, in lots of tournaments, right, what you want to do is maximize your own benefit or points or, or whatever it is that you want to maximize. Obviously, we can change or make rules that try to enforce the behaviors that we want to see, right? And that's a lot of what we do with laws in real life and so on, right? We set the rules of the game looking out for strategies that defect or that exploit others in order to stop these things, but that's absolutely true. If every player's motivation is to get as much points as they can, we can set up the game to sort of get people to do the strategies that we think are more benevolent or we want to see in society. Um, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you, everyone.